We are uh, in the second week of our Fruit of the Spirit series, and this week we are moving to fruit number two, joy. We'll get there in a minute, but we just, I just got to start by asking you, do you know, like really, do you know how much God loves you? You might be like, yeah, sure, Landon, like, I know John 3, 16. Like, he loved the world. He gave Jesus. We have life. Like, he, he loves us. I get it. No, I, do you know how much he loves you? Do you know that your father, your God that is, invited you to call him father, like he delights in you. There's this text in Psalm 147, 11 that says this, the Lord delights, best description for the word joy, by the way, the Lord delights in those who fear him, who put their hope in his unfailing love. What picture of God are we getting here? Like, you guys are going to have to get used to these illustrations because I am overcome with delight, and I'm just going to share it with you. Like, I got me a little grandbaby that's something else. And I thought about showing this video, but my, my youngest was half naked. He didn't have a shirt on. And I just decided I'll, I'll, I'll just tell the story instead. But this last week, we were up in the, our media room, and we were all just kind of hanging out, and, and Lavender was sitting on Maya's lap, and Bryson's running around being a goofball. And there's some kind of connection that Lavender has with Bryson. He just walks in the room, and her eyes light up, and she, she follows him wherever she goes, and this, there's this little kind of giggle underneath, like, <laughs> like what's he going to do kind of thing, right? And so he grabs a pillow and just starts tossing it around, trying to get her attention. And you know that belly laugh that babies get? Like, there's nothing better in the world? Like, it's just... From down here, it's just, <laughs> just this baby joy coming out of her. And Bryson can't get it up. Like he grabs a pillow and he's, he throws it again and another belly laugh. Grabs a pillow and throws it again and another belly laugh. Like just delight coming from my grandbaby. There's nothing better than that. But that doesn't even get close to, I think, describing the delight that our Father has over us. A Dallas Willard described creation as an act of joy because out of creation, God gets to love us. It's the most joy-filled moment in all of eternity because after he creates things, he places us as the crowning moment of it and he turns, he's like, oh, how good it is. And with this kind of delight over us that, that move his way, Jesus in John 10.10 10 says, I've come that you may have life and life to the full. Like, God loves and delights in you and wants everything for you. He has a life that is shaped 
that is a re, it is a possible reality here to live. It's his intention for us that can be described as abundant, overflowing, more than enough, exceptional. Like that's what life to the, like, it's so good that you just are almost embarrassed Like God quit. It's good. It's enough, right? Yesterday I grabbed Reagan's foot and she was on my couch and I couldn't help myself. I just started tickling her and she's, it look, she looks like a fish on the end of a hook. Like she is just flopping all over everything. And quite honestly, that gave Lavender joy as well. Like she enjoyed watching that. And at some point, like she's almost in tears and she's like, enough, right? The fullness of God is intended to be like that. And journey, we just we just settle for something less. That life, I believe, can best be described through the fruit of the Spirit. It's a life of love. Ephesians 5. 22 and 23, of joy, of peace, of patience. I like that word better than forbearance. Kindness, goodness, gentleness, faithfulness, and self-control. This is where life to the full is found. It is what God wants for us. And the best way to describe what this fruit thing is, like it is the result of what comes off of the tree, right? The fruit is the result of the Spirit of God doing His thing in us and having His way with us. The fruit of the Spirit is not us working harder to to have fruit. The fruit of the Spirit is us inviting, and as Adam mentioned last week, us cultivating, us gardening our environment so the Spirit can now work. It's the result of Him working. In fact, in this chapter of Galatians, Paul uses a series of of words constantly kind of pointing us back to this life with and in the Spirit. He describes it like this. He says, walk by the Spirit, be led by the Spirit, live by the Spirit, keep in step with the Spirit. Like he is describing this life, this way of functioning, that is constantly shaped and dependent on the Spirit of God, the Spirit of Jesus taking over. I loved Adam's illustration about being gardeners last week. It's how... It's how this works. It's what God has intended. For the people he delights in to lean into him so that he can show us his way. It's how the Psalms actually start. You remember Psalm 1? Take a look. It says, blessed is the one who does not walk in the way of the wicked. Or stand in the way of sinners or, or sit in the company of mockers, but, but whose delight, there's our word again, right? Think joy, whose delight is in the law of the Lord. 
and who meditates on his law day and night, that person is like a tree planted by the streams of water, which yields its fruit in season, and whose leaf does not wither, whatever they do prospers. The one who delights in receiving the instruction of God because in that instruction is life. It's a different way and a different experience. It's, well, it's freedom. In fact, this, that's the, the, fr- the, the foundation, it's the soil in the conversation in which Paul is planting this fruit thing. You get back to Galatians chapter 5, where we find the fruit of the Spirit, and the whole conversation is about us living as we were intended to live. The whole conversation about the fruit of the Spirit is about us being a people who live in freedom, because that's what we were designed for. It's what Christ died for. Galatians chapter 1, it sets the whole frame. It is for freedom that Christ has set us free. So don't use your freedom to be burdened again by the yoke of slavery. I'm not going to read it all because that would take three hours to deal with all of what's going on here, and I want to get to some other things. But let me just sum it up for you of what's, what's happening here. Paul turns and he's like, why use your freedom that Christ died for, that he is delighted in giving you so much, why use that to go back to the things that used to kill you and take away your freedom? Like, it's so absurd that we would even consider that. He says, instead of like go running after those desires, instead of that, live a life of love that actually can be boiled down to turning your eyes away from yourself and off to someone else because of what you've received because you've been covered up by the love of God, we, we become other-centric instead of self-centric. This whole conversation actually moves us to a place of realizing that instead of being a slave to those desires, we actually become a slave to love. And it is our path to freedom. You see, Christ loved us sacrificially and died for our freedom. Now that he has, the Spirit now moves in and fills us with the capacity to love like that. That fuels and empowers us to now live free. So let me explain. The freest you will ever be. It's so upside down, I just need to pause for a second. I need you to hear this. The freest you will ever be, which in our conversation, it is a guarantee, right? The most joy-filled life you will ever have Give your life away. Sacrifice for the good of someone else. Give till it hurts. 
I dare you. And go home and lay your head down at night after you've done that. You will access what real joy is. We have the capacity to live to the full simply because of Jesus. And his spirit is longing to teach us his way. All right, but we have a problem We have a problem and we have to address it in order to really kind of begin to wrap around how to access this joy thing. And here's the problem. Paul deals with it right in the middle of this conversation in Galatians chapter 5. Here's what he says, verse 16. So I say, walk by the Spirit and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. For the flesh desires what is contrary to the spirit and the spirit what is contrary to the flesh. They are in conflict with each other. So that you are not to do whatever you want. But if you're led by the spirit, you're not under law. So let me explain here. First, when the, this language, walk by the spirit, it is simply describing that we are become a people that go where the Spirit is going, right? We listen to his voice, we discern his will, we follow his guidance, like we are intentionally opening ourselves up to be an influenced and led and shaped by the presence of God in our lives rather than our own desires that come from other things. And what he's saying is those two things are in conflict. We will, as we follow Jesus and get filled up with the Spirit of God, we will always, please please hear this, you will never mature beyond this conflict. I think with maturity, we will be able to see the conflict more. I think with maturity and and being armed by the Spirit, we will learn how to resist the conflict more. We'll be more equipped and more armed to fight in the conflict, but I will... risk by making an authoritative ultimatum statement. I don't even know if that makes sense, but here we go. That until Jesus comes, this, this battle will never end. Verse 17 actually has a translation issue. The way that our NIV translates it says, they're in conflict with each other so that you are not to do whatever you want. The way that that is translated is basically saying, so that when your desires that are opposed from God show up, don't do that. And that is a good and right translation for for this text. Right? Meaning you will have sexual desires. You will have relational issue desires. You will have money desires. You will have envy things. You will like, you will have all kinds of like, you may have alcohol desire. There's, it's never ending. There is stuff in our flesh, in our minds, and in interpersonal relationship stuff that is going to try to kill you every day. It's going to try to rob your freedom every day. 
This battle will occur. And I believe, honestly, the closer, I was talking to the shepherds about this, I think. I think it was the shepherds this week. The closer you get to God, the more you are linked in with the Spirit of God, the more you're going to become aware of how often you have to fight this battle. You'll, you'll see it more. Because our otherness from God will become more and more obvious and we will have to learn to be more and more dependent on him. And we'll find freedom in that. The other side of this text, the other way that this text can and is translated, because that second part is is a weird piece in, in the Greek, it can also be translated so that you do not do what you want. Which means you want to chase God. You want to honor him. You want to invite his spirit to move in you. You want his stuff, but you don't do it. Like that's the conflict too. We have both desires and we have both issues. How do we resolve it? He says in verse 18, if you're under the Spirit, you're not under the law. Here's here's the deal. As we say yes to the Spirit of God, we actually receive the capacity to fulfill the heart of the law of God that used to condemn us. The things that God used to say of don't do this, don't do this, stay out of this. Like we being filled with the Spirit of God rather than that condemning our broken hearts, the Spirit of God moves in us to say, yes, Lord, I want more of this instead of that. The closer we get to the Spirit of God, the more the more that sin and rebellion We'll just kind of turn our stomachs. I may never, Jeff, grow out of, grow enough in in Christ that I grow out of the desire to want the chocolate covered feces candy bar. But the closer that I get to his spirit, the more I the more I know that as soon as I touch it, I'm gonna throw up. Journey. I'm talking about joy today, and I haven't talked a lot about joy. Because it's not about trying to find joy. It's about learning to be people of the Spirit of God. And the result is joy. In rebellion, If you want to look at the list, Galatians chapter 5, 19 through 21, anything that you can imagine that's not of God, it's on that list. And then he says, and the like. So there's a ton more that he didn't list. Rebellion is the worst poison for joy you will ever take. One guarantee 
is that sin will kill your joy. It is impossible to be filled with joy deep in your presence and to live in rebellion to the Spirit of God. And that's why he says, it is for freedom. It is for freedom that he set you free. Why go back? So let's, in the last five minutes, maybe, I say five, you'll give me grace for ten. Let's talk about joy for a second. Our working definition today has been joy's delight. It is this, this just delight. It's Lavender's baby laugh. From the, fl- from, from the fleshly perspective, joy is dependent on the environment, right? It's dependent on ideal circumstances. But the joy of the Spirit is so much more than that. The joy of the Spirit can't even touch what that brings. Like, other way around, but you understand what I mean. Dallas Willard says this, joy is not pleasure, a mere sensation, but a pervasive and constant sense of well-being. Hope, And the goodness of God is joy's indispensable support. It's more than a momentary emotion. But I will tell you that when that, that real joy is present, there will be moments of great delight. But it's not limited to that. Your joy can survive even when those moments aren't there. Let me show you. James chapter 1, verse 2 and 4. I'm not going to put it on the screens, but listen to what he says. He says, consider it pure joy, my brothers. He's, He's a crazy man, but listen to it. Consider it pure joy, my brothers and sisters, whenever you face trials of many kinds. Like, have delight when you have trouble. He's a crazy man. Why? Because the testing will produce, testing your faith produces perseverance, and perseverance finishes its work and may make you complete and mature, lacking nothing. Like, take delight when you're tried because you know that the Spirit of God will grow you up and you're going to have even more than what you had before. That's what he's saying. Think about it for a second. Look at your life. If you follow Jesus for any amount of time, when were the times where you grew the most? When were the times where you actually ended up coming out of that season and you looked more like Jesus than you did before? Was it the times when everything was going right and the world says, oh, you ought to be joyful? I doubt it. In my life, I I have grown to be more like Jesus and listen to the Spirit more when I have gone through the crap storm. That's what he's saying. You can take joy in the midst of that because you know what God's going to do with it. If you're saying yes to him. Jesus says it this way, Matthew chapter 5, Sermon on the Mount. 
11 through 12, he says, blessed are you when people insult you. I need to hear that. I'm just saying. Blessed are you when they persecute you and they falsely say all kinds of evil against you. He says, rejoice. In other words, have joy. Take delight in this. Because great is your reward in heaven. And Jesus helps us here. You see, joy and hope are deeply tied to each other. Jesus is like, when you're going through these kinds of intentional, like people are trying to kill you, rejoice because you know what's coming. The story doesn't end in the midst of them trying to hurt you. There's there's a crown of victory coming for you. Take joy in what's coming. In our teaching conversation this this week, Brady reminded us of a story that in Acts chapter 5, the apostles actually did this. They were flogged for the name of Jesus, and they left, it says, rejoicing because they were seen as worthy for suffering in the name. Like the Beatitudes actually got lived out in real time in their lives as they're getting scars on their backs. They weren't happy. Joy is not happy. But there's this undeniable delight in their soul because they're confident of what's next. In the midst of their backs being ripped apart. That's why the Hebrew writer can say, In Hebrews 12, 2. For the joy set before him, he endured the cross. Like, can you imagine? Can you imagine Jesus, the God of creation, staring down his own death and the overwhelming, like we see the picture of him crying and weeping and begging for this not to happen, but the, the overwhelming delight in the midst of that hurt and pain and fear, the overwhelming delight because he knows what's going to come. The victory is about to be won and nobody can take it away. Journey, that is joy. That's where it's found. And that's actually what Jesus says in John 16. Right before he goes to the cross, he turns to the disciples and he says, now is your time for grief, but I will see you again and you will rejoice. And no one will be able to take away your joy. I have a whole other thing I was going to do, and I will, I think I'm going to send you to think and pray through it yourself. But it leads us to the question of what do we do then? How do we grow in this? How do we move toward joy? And my answer to you is Jesus. My answer is it's John 15. Your King James Bible is probably said, abide in me, is what he says. 
Our NIV Bibles help us with that. They, they say, remain. Remain in me. It's this garden metaphor, right? He's the vine, we're the branches. He says, apart from me, you can do nothing. Remain in me. Remain in his words. Remain in his love. And that remaining in his love is receiving his love, like, like drink it in, even when you don't believe it, like read it and ask God, ask his spirit to convince you, like remain in his love. And then extend it. Just remain in Jesus. Go read John 15 and ask the Spirit of God. Because it is in Jesus and it is in His Spirit that all of this happens. Nowhere else. So I'll borrow from the ancients and I'll leave you with this as the band comes up. Christ before me. Christ behind me. Christ above me. Christ below me. Christ in my thoughts, Christ in my words, Christ in my actions, Christ covering my past, Christ guiding my present, Christ preparing my future. It is not I that live, but Christ who lives in me. Where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom.